This is Power Hour with Gabriella Power. Hello and welcome to Power Hour. Plenty coming up on the show. We'll cross to London for a deep dive on the controversy surrounding the royal family and we'll cross to Miami as America takes a significant leap forward in the race to the White House and we have Erin Molan and Chris Kenny joining us on the panel later in the program. But first, what a week for the royal family. Let me start off by saying my sympathy is with the Princess of Wales who has taken the blame for something that is not her fault. Princess Catherine is still recovering from abdominal surgery. She hasn't been well. And now she's the one who has had to take the fall for something I highly doubt she did in the first place. I find it hard to believe that Prince William took that Mother's Day photograph that Kensington Palace claimed that he did. And I find it hard to believe that Kate was the one who edited the photo on her phone and posted it on the Prince and Princess of Wales Instagram page. All of this was clearly in the hands of the Royals' public relations and communications team, who carelessly chose this image, overlooking several of the obvious and embarrassing errors in the photograph with a bland, cheery message. And when they were caught out for releasing an image which had been doctored, they let the Princess of Wales take the fall, posting a message on her behalf, claiming that it was Kate, a typical mother, experimenting with editing. Now, what that feels like is a lie. The palace has had decades of knowing what they say is believed, but what they're doing on behalf of Kate and William right now is eroding trust. And we all know once trust is broken, it's hard to get back. Thankfully, the world knows and loves Kate. Many of us feel like she's our princess. We've seen her love story with Prince William from the very beginning. We've watched her step up time and time again in her role as a working royal, and we stand with her. While the palace is under pressure to explain what exactly is going on here, what we can't forget is the most important part in all of this is that Kate gets the support that she needs and that she's able to recover quickly. We're not expecting to see Princess Catherine attend royal engagements until after Easter at the earliest, but when we do, the public needs to show its love and support and welcome her back with open arms. Joining us now from London is Royal commentator Josh Rom. Josh, great to speak to you again. Since the last time we spoke, the Princess of Wales has apologised for editing a family photo that was shared on Mother's Day in the UK. My sympathy is with Kate, as we know, but it does call into question how truthful our institutions are. Yes, exactly that. First and foremost, lovely, of course, to speak to you again, Gabriella, my favourite host. Um, <laughs> but yes, this does call into question our institutions. I don't think it necessarily, this whole debacle, I don't think it necessarily makes the Princess of Wales look that bad. I don't think it reflects that badly on her. I mean, she is, by her own admission, an amateur photographer. And we know that she doesn't, in her normal day-to-day -day life, she would not by any means have enough time to perfect the Photoshop skills uh, re required for the standard of a professional. We know we know this. But what it does, it, it, it calls into question our institutions because we saw a real litany of problems here. First and foremost, we saw that she wasn't wearing her wedding ring. That was just one editorial uh, problem with the photo, but, but there were really basic issues that we saw. Just then we saw in the photos, problems with the pavement, problems with Princess Charlotte's heel, problems where part of the sleeve of her jumper was missing, problem with the way her hair finished on one of her shoulders, uh, problems with Prince Louis and Prince George's fingers, uh, problems with the Princess of Wales's fingers looking slightly blurry and one looking more blurry than the other. There was a whole litany of problems here uh, that were discovered not just by the photo agencies, but by fans. And this was an official photograph released by the palace. So I think it calls into question a number of things. Number one, what was the Princess of Wales, by her own admission, an amateur photographer 
doing being allowed to tamper or edit with official portraits too mm. this is this was an official portrait released on an official gating um occasion celebrated by the country so what so why was there not proper scrutiny given to this particular portrait bearing in mind the princess herself edited it um bearing in mind due to this vacuum that's been created by the palace themselves by not commenting publicly on uh, or giving us constant updates uh, for the Princess of Wales's um, recovery period from that serious abdominal surgery, bearing in mind, I don't think we have or necessarily, we don't have a right to know about her recovery. Uh, we know that the Prince and Princess of Wales are very private people. Medical information, unless this is absolutely necessary, should absolutely be kept private. And that is absolutely her pr prerogative. But what this shows it shows that the palace have created a vacuum which has allowed conspiracy theories and all sorts of deranged nonsense to absolutely flow on on online about the princess of wales and her recovery um so this is a problem created by the palace themselves. This is a massive yeah. own goal. And it means that any action of the Prince and Princess of Wales would of course be under higher scrutiny than usual. So why wasn't this photo put under higher scrutiny? And last but not least, you know, we had American journalists making a joke about this and asking the White House pre press secretary if uh, they have edited any of the president's pictures. This has made Kensington Palace look like an absolute laughing stock on the world stage. And the fact that institutions on a worldwide level are being called into question this is a really it's not just a bad look for the establishment so to speak it's not a bad look for the palace it's a bad look for the west's institutions that they let uh you know problems like this get that get this far get out of hand yeah, and they've got a lot to answer for here. I just think it's unfair that Princess Catherine was the one that had to apologise on her Instagram story when the, you know, Kensington Palace is the one that has let this story get out of control and, and their decisions is what has fuelled some of the wild conspiracy theories that are out there. Speaking to so many people, a lot just can't get enough of it. They do deep dives on online. Look, we've also heard from Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. They have reacted to Princess Catherine's controversial photo edit. What's been said? Well, they've reacted of sorts. I can't exactly say that they've given much heartfelt warm wishes for the Princess of Wales's recovery. And as of yet, I am unaware of any statement that has been issued that publicly wishes the princess well. But uh, basically what ha happened was page six uh, in the US reported that a source close to the Sussexes basically compared this debacle with Meghan, saying that, well, uh, the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan, has a keen eye for detail, and, and this would have never have happened under her watch. Bearing in mind, of course, we've seen plenty of Photoshop photos from uh, <laughs> Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. We've seen photos where Prince Harry all of a sudden has hair are plenty growing, when in fact we see publicly in images that, you, you know, his hair is thinning, I think it can be said. Um, but that was what Page Six reported. But actually, an Archiewell spokesperson kind of spat back at this and said, with all due respect, this did not come from us. So Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have basically denied any sort of allegation that they're speaking out about uh, the Princess Catherine's recovery and that they're, that they're comparing Princess Catherine to Meghan of any kind. So they're, they're fundamentally denying that any detail or any source close to the sus, uh, you know, they're, they're denying that any anything has come from them. Yes, page six didn't report that this came from them. This page six reported that this was a source close to them. But the fact remains, they haven't wished the Princess of Wales uh, well. They haven't uh, sent their love to the Princess of Wales publicly. They've been rather silent on that front, considering that they like to live their truth in a very public way and make all these bombshell accusations. When the monarchy is suffering or when the monarchy is... Uh, 
you know, in a very, vo not so much a volatile situation, but a very temperamental situation at the moment, where, of course, His Majesty the King is uh, battling a form of cancer and is undergoing treatment for that. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Camilla, has had to take a break due to undergoing uh, and carrying on the burden, saying that she had energy that she never knew that she had. And we have uh, the Prince of Wales pulling out of very significant events due to personal matters you know the Sussexes have been awfully quiet on that front don't you think it's a great question it's a great point where are Harry and Meghan where are they you know you've got Princess Catherine that has been battling uh, recovering I should say from a serious abdominal surgery we're all concerned about her health Williams had to take a step back as you've said Queen Camilla had to take a break for a week as well, King Charles I mean, is, is battling cancer yeah, I've got to tell you, it just shows that rather than wishing well on their on their family on a public level, it just shows that they're con more concerned about their keeping up their own reputation. You know, oh no, that that quote didn't come from us. No, 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 it, it didn't come from us. So their spokesperson says, okay, what about the well wish? That seems to be missing from yeah, from that, any sort of statement, yeah. doesn't it? They're happy to clarify those statements to, to make sure that they look good, but any well wishes we're yet to hear. Well, speaking of Prince Harry, a federal judge has ordered the Department of Homeland Security to hand over Prince Harry's visa application amid a court battle over the release of documents stemming from revelations about the Duke of Sussex's use of illegal drugs. Josh, how is that going to go down? For me, this story is absolutely fascinating because I think that whatever happens this is a lose-lose for Prince Harry because what we know is that a uh, conservative think tank in the US the Heritage Foundation has sued the Department of Homeland Security uh, the DHS and just tonight actually a representative from the Heritage Foundation actually spoke on a UK news channel tonight um effectively accusing uh, Prince Harry of receiving preferential treatment. But I think this is an absolute lose-lose case for Prince Harry because no matter the result, it makes him look bad. Either one, he lied on his form, uh, and or two, he was truthful on the form or and received preferential treatment, or three, um, his book is absolutely discredited. And if he lied on his form um, saying that he didn't take drugs, then that's the opposite of his book, Spare. Uh, and, and and there have been reports that, uh, you know, sources close to him might may or may not have said that uh, the book uh, exaggerates facts. So either or either his book is discredited or he's lied on his form or he's received preferential treatment in this. So whatever happens when it comes to this immigration uh, case, this visa case, I should say, it's not quite immig immigration, but whatever happens with this visa case, it's a lose-lose scenario for Prince Harry because he is either, he, he either lied on a very public level or he mm. has been discredited and his work has been discredited on a very high level, meaning what else is in the book is is what else in in that book is, is an untruth and yeah. that those and, and again this is the thing it's like the photo it's like the photo rather than quelling any sorts of concerns um when it comes to the princess of wales's uh health health care all it does it, it doesn't quell any concerns it, it it only gives us more questions to ask so and and that's the thing when it comes to this visa case is there are only more questions that are going to be asked about Prince Harry and what's in that book, what was in the Netflix documentary, what was in the Oprah interview, what has been said on all the podcasts. It, it, the, the cat might be let out of the bag here. We'll wait and see. There's certainly a lot of interest into whether he did lie on his visa application, the question being whether he took drugs. Of course, he admitted to it in that book. So we will wait and see. Josh, Meghan Markle has had a win. Her sister, Samantha, has lost her defamation lawsuit against her. What's happened here? Well, Samantha Markle was suing her half-sister, Meghan, for defamation. And a uh, judge has basically thrown out this case, uh, saying that uh, she couldn't effectively, she couldn't prove that Meghan Markle had properly defamed her in, in, in any way. So Meghan has had a, a win with this case. Um, I, I mean, the, th the thing is... <laughs> 
we we say what we want about the Netflix documentaries and all of that stuff, but actually, I mean, the thing is about both Samantha and Meghan's half brother Thomas Markle is that actually, bef but when the, the engagement was first announced between Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, Samantha Markle and Thomas Markle were absolutely glowing about Meghan, saying, you know, the the royal family are lucky to have her. She's such a a great a great person, and and all of this sort of stuff. And then they weren't invited to the wedding, and all hell broke loose. They started slamming. Uh, the, the 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 Duchess of Sussex left, right, and center in the media. Um, I, I mean, l l listen, Samantha Markle has made bold claims. Meghan has a essentially said that um, you know they didn't have much of a relationship. She didn't see much of Samantha Markle. So I think in this case, it, it's it's the word of one against the other. And a judge in this case has ruled that uh, Meghan has not defamed um, her, her half-sister, or at least her half-sister doesn't really have a case um, against, uh, or at least Samantha Markle doesn't really have a, a case against Meghan Markle for defamation. But also one has to kind of look into, you know, the, the, uh, the exact, details and when it comes to defamation what does defamation mean it, it basically means you know one it, you're defaming someone's character and and it, and you know after a defamation case they might find it hard to find employment so does this kind of if we look at the the kind of just the factors around this is samantha markle effectively saying in court and this is purely a question that that by megan saying that they don't have a relationship it means that she can't earn money from this you know that's a question that could be asked so i mean this is a win for megan markle and I mean, listen, I think it says it all that she she doesn't she she isn't yet speaking to her father, Thomas Markle. As far as we know, they haven't been in contact for a number of years now, um, pr pretty much since uh, he, he uh, set up those paparazzi shots before the royal wedding and then underwent that hot, that serious heart surgery. Uh, so, you know, the, the problems in the Markle family um, or... I should say Meghan's father's side of the family, uh, they're not dying down anytime soon. Josh Rom, Royal Commentator, always my favourite guest. Thank you so much for coming on Power Hour. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Gabriella. Former special counsel Robert Hur, who investigated Joe Biden's alleged handling of classified documents, has defended his report and assessment of the president before Congress. He described Joe Biden as a well-meaning man with a poor memory. There has been a lot of attention paid to language in the report about the president's memory, so let me say a few words about that. My task was to determine whether the president retained or disclosed national defense information willfully. That means knowingly and with the intent to do something the law forbids. I could not make that determination without assessing the president's state of mind. My assessment in the report about the relevance of the president's memory was necessary and accurate and fair. Most importantly, what I wrote is what I believe the evidence shows. Robert Hur continued to defend his wording of the report. So this lengthy, expensive, and independent investigation resulted in a complete exoneration of President Joe Biden. For every document you discussed in your report, you found insufficient evidence. I need to um, go back and, and make sure that I take take note of the word that you used, uh, exoneration. That Mr. is not a word Her, that I'm going to continue with my questions. I'm going to continue with my questions. I know that, that the term that I ultimately reached I know that whether the term sufficient evidence existed such that the likely you outcome you, you exonerated would be a conviction. Him. I know that the not term willful him. retention not has a... Mr. Hurd, it's my time. Joining us is senior editor at large of Newsweek, Josh Hammer. Josh, great to speak with you. What's your assessment of Robert Hur's testimony? You know, I thought that Robert Hur acquitted himself perfectly well. You know, it's funny, after he released this much-anticipated, very lengthy 300-plus page report, over a month ago now, he, he managed to do the impossible, which is basically tick off partisans on essentially all sides. So you had Democrats who are apoplectic, who are up in arms. 
because he had the temerity, he had the temerity, the chutzpah, to start talking about Joe Biden not really having it, not really having all of his marbles, starting to lose it a little bit. That was what you just heard him talking about there when it comes to not having the, <clears throat> excuse me, not having the willful mental state. But on the other side of the aisle, you had Republicans who were up in arms as well because he ended up not recommending charges of Joe Biden. So at that time, he really was under fire from all from all directions. Gabby, I guess me personally, I watched this yesterday here in the United States, and I, I thought he did a fine job here. I thought that his ultimate recommendation to not pursue charges was defensible. You have to understand also in America's unique constitutional structure, there is a longstanding Department of Justice policy that we have had in place for a half century going back to the Nixon administration in 1973 that says that you cannot actually indict a sitting current president of the United States. What that means is that Joe Biden was really not going to be indicted here. The best case scenario that we could possibly have hoped for was to lay the precedent for him to be prosecuted after he is president, just like they're trying to do to Donald Trump right now. So I thought Robert Hur, honestly, he's a consummate professional. He's been a longtime prosecutor. He's a conservative. He clerked for a very, very conservative Supreme Court justice here in America, Chief Justice William Rehnquist. And I thought that he did a fine job on Capitol Hill. Again, the partisans on both sides are not going to like it there. But he, most importantly, Gabby, he defended himself very well when it came to the clip that we mm. just saw, which is that he was not exonerating Joe Biden. He was pointing out very troubling conduct. He just couldn't ultimately recommend charges. I agree. I think he handled himself very well, and it was very important that he did make that point. He wasn't exonerating Joe Biden. Look, the US House has passed a bill that could lead to a nationwide ban of TikTok if the Chinese-based owner doesn't sell the platform. Here's Donald Trump's reaction. A lot of good, and there's a lot of bad with TikTok. But the thing I don't like is that without TikTok, you can make Facebook bigger. And I consider Facebook to be an enemy of the people, along with a lot of the media. When I look at it, I'm not looking to make Facebook double the right. size. And if you, if you ban TikTok, Facebook, and others, right. uh, but mostly Facebook will be a, a big beneficiary. I think Facebook has been very bad for our country, especially when it comes to elections. Mm -hmm. This is how TikTok users are reacting. I think that's uh, unfair. Um, I just, uh, I don't know. I think people are just assuming that it's doing harm, and I don't think that that's true or appropriate. I feel like it'd be very disruptive, um, specifically for people that are content creators. I feel like it'd be very disruptive to their, um, their um, financial wellness. Yeah. Josh Hammer, what's your reaction to all of this? Is it fair? Is it going to go through? Uh, I think TikTok should be completely banned. And I think that Donald Trump, with all due respect, is totally dead wrong on this issue. Funny enough, Donald Trump actually will have the correct stance on this issue towards the end of his presidency. In the final year or two of his presidency, he started to lead the charge for a national ban on TikTok. It's really not entirely clear what has happened since then. He has since in recent weeks apparently got in cozy with a, a mega billionaire Republican donor by the name of Jeffrey Yass, whose hedge fund owns a roughly 15% stake in TikTok. In fact, that same donor, Jeffrey Yass, is now funding a conservative group here in America called the Club for Growth. The Club for Growth is actually paying former Trump aide Kellyanne Conway to go lobby on Capitol Hill against a TikTok ban. It all feels very swampy, if I'm being very honest to you. And Trump famously in 2016 ran on draining the swamp and the fact that he has had a very sudden change of heart here after a quick conversation with a billionaire donor with a mega billion dollar stake in TikTok. It just feels very, very icky and very, very swampy. Look, when it comes to the substance here, TikTok is Chinese Communist Party spyware. That is literally what it is. ByteDance, which is the company that owns TikTok, is fully controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. If ByteDance controls TikTok, then the Politburo, the Xi Jinping Politburo in, in Beijing, ultimately controls TikTok. They are able to spy on us. They are able to surveil us. And they are also pumping the algorithm filled with anti-Western civilization, anti-American, pro-Hamas, pro-terrorist content. It wasn't that long ago that Osama bin Laden's infamous letter to America that he wrote in the early aughts. It wasn't that long ago that that video was trending viral on TikTok. TikTok also rigs its algorithms to pump all sorts of videos when it comes to gender dysphoria and gender ideology and, and the transgender phenomenon, trying to induce teenage girls into trying to do these surgeries to chop off their healthy 12, 13-year-old breasts. It is a cancer. It is an absolute cancer, TikTok. To me, it is a total no-brainer 
this bill in the House when it came to trying to force a divestiture of ByteDance to sell TikTok actually passed the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee by a 50 to 0 vote. When is the last time there's been any issue in the U.S. Congress to attract a 50 to 0 margin? I think it is an absolute no-brainer, and I hope that it passes the Senate and is signed into law by President Joe Biden. OK, well, it is interesting to see Donald Trump change his tune on that one. On Donald Trump, he has won the Republican nomination. What's his secret to solidifying his influence on the Republican Party, do you think? Look, going back to 2016, which was a very crowded primary, Donald Trump broke through a very crowded field. He defeated Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, Ben Carson, Rand Paul. I mean, the, the, it was a very crowded field that year. He was willing to say and do things that others were not willing to say and do. And he was also willing to challenge some pre-existing orthodoxies within the Republican establishment that had grown very sclerotic. And he basically ran on three issues. And those three issues were trade, immigration, and foreign policy. And he ran somewhat contrary to the Republican establishment consensus on all three issues. So when it came to foreign policy, he was willing to challenge the neoconservative boondoggles abroad. He was challenging the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, the failed intervention in Libya in 2011. When it came to trade, he was a protectionist. Donald Trump has always been in favor of protective tariffs, in favor of reshoring manufacturing, in favor of trying to bolster the American heartland against the predations of those who would offshore manufacturing and various supply chains overseas. And then when it comes to his signature issue of immigration, he was willing to simply say things that others had no interest in saying. So back in the day, the Republican pablum was illegal immigration bad, legal immigration good. Trump just took a sledgehammer to that and said, you know, we should be looking at reducing all immigration. Uh, obviously, illegal immigration is bad, but we've got a culture to preserve here and a country to preserve. So he was really able to challenge the status quo. And then, of course, he's a, he's a massive force of personality. The guy is a global icon. His names are on buildings all around the world, golf resorts, country clubs, you name it. So I think those two factors combined, that really is the key to success for him. At this point, the Republican Party in the year 2024, Gabby, there is no doubt about it. It is obviously Donald Trump's party, period, full stop, end of story. Yeah, well, it looks like it's going to be a Trump versus Biden rematch. But what about Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? Um, is, are you, do you expect that we're going to see some momentum for, for his campaign? And if so, where are the votes coming from? I guess it depends what we're defining as momentum, right? So America has not had a third-party challenger look like he's polling as high as RFK Jr. since the early 1990s, back when Ross Perot effectively won the election for Bill Clinton, really stole it for George H.W. Bush back in 92. A, a third-party candidate has never won a presidential election in America, unless you go all the way back to 1860, back when the Republican Party was possibly viewed as a, as a third party. So it's unlikely that he's going to win. The question is, can he do real damage, and where are those votes going to come from? And it's not just RFK. There's actually another organization called No Labels. That is a moderate centrist group. They're looking to fund a candidate as well, get that candidate on ballots all across America. They're trying to peel away from both Republicans and Democrats. And then you have your usual candidates like Jill Stein of the Green Party. And then you have the absolute socialist loon bag Cornell West, a Princeton University professor who is running on a far left socialist platform. If you look at all of these factors combined, I think that Trump benefits. I think that Trump benefits a lot from all these other people running. RFK is going to take some votes from both camps, but I think that he'll he will take more from Biden. And the early polling that we have on this does indicate that for the very simple reason that his last name is Kennedy. Kennedy is about as Democratic Party royalty as it gets. It is, it is a cachet. It is the name in Democratic circles and has been for 50, 60 years. The Kennedy family is absolute royalty in contemporary American politics. Now, is he a little far out there compared to most other Democrats? Sure. But I think if you start to get into the polling cross tabs based on what we see thus far, he does peel away more from Democrats than from Republicans. And I was I was looking actually just earlier today at the Real Clear Politics polling average, which is kind of the holy grail of American political polling. And right now, a Trump versus Biden mano a mano matchup has Trump up by an average of 1.8 points in that head to head matchup. When you throw in all, all those candidates I just mentioned, RFK, Jill Stein, Cornell West, Trump goes from up 1.8 to up 2.7, so his lead actually increases. So I think Donald Trump is, is sitting pretty pretty good right now when it comes to RFK, and I, for one, hope for that very simple reason, actually, that RFK is able to get on the ballot in many more states. 
Let's look at Joe Biden. Benjamin Netanyahu has angrily responded to a US intelligence assessment suggesting his hold on office is at risk and accusing the Biden administration of trying to overthrow him. How is the fracturing of the relationship between Netanyahu and Biden going to impact Joe Biden in America? I think the way that the Biden administration and Joe Biden in particular, the way that they are handling the current war in Gaza is nothing short of disgraceful and disgusting. Uh, you had Joe Biden speaking in the State of the Union address here recently in America where he, he was literally citing Hamas propaganda when it comes to the number of alleged casualties in Gaza. Hamas infamously makes no distinction whatsoever between civilians and, and militants when they are reporting their death tolls among the various other errors they make. Joe, Joe Biden is now talking about a ceasefire. He's actually using the C word for the first time. He and Kamala Harris are both talking about a ceasefire query how long they want that to be, but that's what they're talking about. They are now openly speculating and leaking to the media that they are thinking of cutting off aid to Israel while they are in the middle of, of an existential conflict. Look, Gabby, my very simple question is, Israel is a very important ally of America. We share intelligence, we share defense, we share critical industries. Mossad and CIA are very close. I mean, we're, we're about as close as two countries can be when it comes to all of our common shared interests. What message does it send to all of America's other purported allies around the world, including Australia, if America is not willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with one of its best alleged allies in the middle of an existential crisis? It sends a horrible, horrible message. It sends a message that America's word ultimately means absolutely nothing whatsoever. But unfortunately, perhaps, the politics, I think, for both Biden and BB are pretty good. The politics for Biden of this standoff are good because it allows him to shore up his far-left voter base, radical Muslim Americans in Dearborn, Michigan, Minneapolis, Minnesota, places like that. And then for Bibi Netanyahu, the fact that he is now facing a very hostile president and the fact that he thus far has been righteously defiant of what Joe Biden is saying— that allows Bibi to shore up his own flank as well. It allows him to shore up his own right-wing voters. So the, the domestic political considerations right now possibly do militate in favor of a further standoff. Unfortunately, that's not good for either the United States or Israel. But as of now, it looks like Bibi Netanyahu, to his great credit, is essentially flipping two middle fingers at Joe Biden. I hope that he continues to do so because it's really shameful stuff that we're seeing from Joe Biden right now. Josh Hammer, thank you so much for coming on Power Hour. Really appreciate your insights and analysis. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Well, U.S. lawmakers have moved one step closer to banning TikTok. The House of Representatives have passed a bill giving TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, 165 days to divest its stake in the U.S. version of the app amid security concerns. On this vote, the yeas are 352, the nays are 65, one present, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without the objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. This is how some content creators are reacting. I'll keep going, guys. Don't worry. I'm not going to go anywhere. But unfortunately, we are seeing the demise of TikTok as we speak. These are the people that we voted in. And uh, I think we need to find out exactly who the hell voted to get rid of TikTok. China's not my threat. The United States is my threat. Joining us in the studio is Sky News host Chris Kenny and Sky News host Erin Mullen. Thank you so much for joining us on Power Great Hour. Yep. Yeah, lovely to see you. Look, what do you make of this ban? We know that Donald Trump doesn't want TikTok to be banned, saying that all these content creators are going to go to Meta, it's going to benefit <laughs> Meta. What do you think, Chris Kenny? Oh, Gab, I find it hard to believe that this will actually happen. I know it's passed the lower house uh, in the US. It's got to get through the Senate yet. And then Joe Biden, of course, would have to sign off on it. I, I can't see it happening. Now, I think the security concerns are real, but uh, Americans 
love freedom of speech more than anything mm. else. It's one of the fundamental principles of, of the US and they also love to dance and muck around on TikTok, <laughs> as we've seen. So I just can't see the government following through on this. I think they need to do something. I think there's got to be other ways to legislate any blocks on any uh, suspicious uh, technology attached to algorithms attached to TikTok and the rest of it. To ban them unless they mm. sell out to American interests effectively is a big step for America. Erin, what do you think? We've obviously seen some reaction there from content creators and naturally they're quite worried. I know some people are reacting pretty strongly on, online, but but what do you think? It kind of reminded me of the videos that, remember those Britney Spears fans did <laughs> crying? <laughs> Britney, Britney. So look, I, I don't leave have, Britney alone. Leave Britney alone. <laughs> I don't have a lot of empathy for them. I think, you know, old mate saying we're witnessing the demise of TikTok doesn't quite understand how politics works in that still got to go through the Senate. There's a long way to go. It could be a new president. Trump, though, has changed his mind on this, obviously. He was calling mm. for the ban of it a few years ago when it wasn't so flattering for him and he wasn't particularly fond of it. But he's right in that it would give Meta a huge, almost a complete share of the market, which is dangerous. We know what they're doing here with news. They're already so powerful. So anything that gives them more power, I don't think, is a good thing. Uh, but I agree with Chris. I think, you know, you look at America with, you know, the freedom and, and rights that they value and right to bear arms, freedom yeah. of speech, et cetera. They, it, more than anything else, they care deeply about that. So I don't think this will happen, I agree, but uh, the security risk is... is definitely real yeah uh, and I think it's something we've all got to be conscious of and we follow I think we we're last one of the last countries to follow suit here and banning it on government phones but yeah we'll watch with interest oh yeah we will watch and well it's interesting on that point Elon Musk says that this is really about censorship so there will be yeah. a lot of backlash if this was to go through absolutely are you on TikTok uh, no well, I couldn't yeah. do anything worse they tried <laughs> tried to sign maybe we on should radio. get on there and all dance for freedom President <laughs> Biden <laughs> is he's on TikTok well, he that's doesn't it. Ban it he's trying to attract they a younger were, audience now they so. were against it and then it's Yes. You know, he's trying to jump on the Taylor Swift exactly. bandwagon yeah. and then yeah. dancing to her music, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Are you on TikTok? That's the question. No, no. Um, <laughs> Why not? Well, I think I'd break it. You'd break it. Right. Yeah, yeah. so viral. If I was dancing, yeah, honestly, they wouldn't be able to handle the traffic. Well, it's, it's funny. So, so many young people are on it. They're watching all those dance videos. I did get on it at the start of COVID, then I quickly deleted it because I realised how much time I was spending yeah, on yeah. the app. But so many, I suppose, some millennials and even Gen Zs are getting their news sources from TikTok, mm. and that's what's a little bit concerning. All, all this algorithm. stuff, I worry about their news sources. I worry about the misinformation that's spread mm -hmm. on so much of social media. Unless you're going to trust it, news sources via social media, then you, you, there's a lot of rubbish out there. And even then well, it's fraught sometimes. Hello, ABC. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but all the tracking as well, right? I'm yeah. spooked by how much Instagram and Facebook know about my personal uh, interests and uh, where I want to buy a follow, where I dream about, you know, you, you look for holiday homes yeah. and places you'd love to buy. Next year, inundated with all this yep. stuff because oh, they think scary. you're a regular buyer. You yeah. say something and the next second there's yeah. an ad there. Yeah. The other app that's quite concerning, which I didn't flag with you guys as well, was Snap Map. Have you heard of that? No. One of my stepsisters had a party and the next second there was people coming from everywhere and they could it's like a find oh, my friends no. with Snapchat. Yeah. so once you can see Gate where everyone way. is yeah <laughs> well instagram apparently if now something's come in that you have to then go and actively switch off which is your location so when you look at stalking and other issues that we're having significant problems with in the community mm. at the moment as well there are and a whole other danger. Don't start me on social media yet, and the dangers of it because I will not shut up. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gets you get to the point, though. So this American thing with TikTok, I mean, the desperately serious security issues here. You know, it's not a flippant issue. I, I just don't think they'll go through with a full-scale ban. I think the that's US a step too far. But, but the security that? issues are, are put in. In the US, the government employees are told not to have TikTok because yeah. of the tracking and security breaches. So a full-on full ban, though, you, you have to think it's unlikely. the Osama bin Laden resurgence that happened at the end of last year off the back of October 7th. Yeah. And all the videos and all these young kids, you know, and but, but it's just, it's such a fine line, isn't it, between not wanting that kind of influence to go to young, vulnerable people who don't know any better and clearly have no desire or willingness to educate themselves in, in structured ways, look at that and go, oh, yeah, that's amazing. You know, you're almost... What's the word when you... Um, a whole generation of people when you're... What's the word when you're, like, coercing them into believing something that's not oh, true? Yeah. You're, I can't think of the word. Indoctrination. Indo exactly. Yeah. It's something to, to akin to that. Mm. And, but... Where do you stop freedom of speech? You know, you almost oh, have to let so people... It's, it's a tough one. You've got all this ahead of you as a parent. Oh, oh My God, little boys are just getting into that era. You've got a few years to yeah. wait, but that's such oh, a it's worry. It's terrifying.
Yeah. Well, sticking with US news, Donald Trump has won the Republican nomination for the 2024 presidential election, setting up a rematch with Joe Biden. Trump and Biden are projected to win their party's presidential primaries in each of their states. Now we have to get back to work because we have the worst president in the history of our country. His name is Joe Biden, sometimes referred to as Crooked Joe Biden, and he must be defeated. Our nation is failing. We're a nation that is in serious decline. We've never had a situation like this where we're not respected, we're laughed at, we're considered almost a joke. Aaron, I suppose that's no surprise seeing Donald Trump being the Republican nominee. Um, where do you see this going? We know that Trump is ahead of Biden uh, in the polls. The latest poll shows that he's mm. uh, 40 per cent to Biden's 38 per cent. I still, we've still got a long way to go between now and November 5. What do you make of it? Oh, it's a fascinating contest. And I just love this stuff anyway from an entertainment perspective. But... I guess even from a, a, an Australian perspective, we have so much riding on the outcome of this election. And it's so interesting. Nikki Haley, obviously the last uh, Republican to drop out, but her argument over the entire period was that Trump can't beat Biden, so there's no point putting him in. At the moment, I'm beating Biden when you put us two together, but Trump can't. That's now shifted. We've seen a change. And, of course, it could change a million times. But... Uh, Biden did well at the State of the Union speech in, in that he didn't mm. completely capitulate and screw it up, but I think his cognitive ability will play a massive part over the next few months. If he can hold it together, he's got much more of a chance. Uh, Trump, when it comes to Australia, he's obviously very isolationist in his national security policies and we cannot rest in our laurels like we've done for basically our entire existence, well, the, the recent part of that anyway, and expect America to defend us because we're going to be in a lot of trouble if Trump comes in. I think America will be in a better place under Trump. I don't think he's, you know, a moral beacon of hope. I think, you know, he's a flawed individual, absolutely, but he's a stronger leader than Biden, but it may hurt us as well. Yeah, he's a, such a divisive figure here, mm. isn't he, Chris Kenny? And around the world and in the US. I just think, you know, the great republic, the leader yep. of the free world, and this is the best they can give their people, yep. a choice between Trump and Biden. It was bad enough the first time, and now we're going to be back there again. I still, in my heart of hearts, don't think Joe Biden will run. I can't see how the Democrats could risk everything on allowing Joe Biden to run. They have to, A decide on another candidate and be convinced Joe Biden to quit. It's easy for him to quit. He just yeah. says, you know, I've, I've decided that I'm, I'm not Where really up to Jill? it. Where is Jill? Surely, yeah. Jill, like, this is what you do when you love, you know, yeah. honey, it's enough. Yeah, but, but well, she's doing the opposite. She was oh, the one fronting the cameras at the start absolutely. of the year saying, I see his big eye. Oh, I yeah. Well, she loves it's living like, in the big house, right? <laughs> yeah, I get it. But, I get and, it. And, it's painful and, to watch. And, and she's so influential, you know, probably maybe the most influential first lady since Eleanor Roosevelt because, uh, yeah. I mean, Joe for, we can see, can't really think for himself. Look, I just think the switch in for the Democrats can't be ruled out because mm -hmm. it would be ludicrous for them to talk about it now. It would be ludicrous for anyone to put up their hand. He can't quit now because then, of course, Kamala Harris gets the job. Oh. They have to wait till the convention or just afterwards and, and then it, he quits and they have to install... The Democrat National Convention has to install a new ticket. You know, uh, you know um, Michelle Obama and, uh, and uh, Gavin Newsom or something like that. And, and then they have a fresh team to, to run against Trump. But, you know, at the moment... It looks like it's Trump versus Biden. And, and I think while the Democrats think, oh, yeah, Biden can beat Trump because he did it last time, I think mm. it's fraught with danger. Yeah. I think Trump could, could well uh, upset that apple cart. And turnout will play a big part, of course, as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, As yeah. it does every time. I saw this thing written recently, the, the lesser of two evils, but this is the evil of two lessers. And it's so yeah. true. It's, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> and I, that was not mine. I it's, didn't make that up, but I read it. Yeah, mm. the sentiment really is just everyone's so disheartened that these are mm. really the two options. Independent Rob F. Kennedy Jr. will announce his running mate on March 26 in California. Um, do you expect he could pick up momentum, seeing as we've got Trump versus Biden? And, and if so, who's voting for him? Are they uh, his votes coming from Trump supporters or, or potentially Biden supporters? Yeah, well, that's the thing, Gab. Uh, you know, if he does pick up a strong cohort of votes, I think with a name like Kennedy, he's going to get a lot of them from the Democrat, the disaffected Democrat voters as well. There's no more famous name for the Democrats than, than Kennedy. But I, I think in the end it's going to be a polarised contest. I think it's going to... If it is Biden, then Trump-Biden, the, the electorate will have to make that choice. And, you know, even if they switch someone else in for Biden, it's all going to be about that person and whether they can stop Trump. So we'll see. But I think with this, it's, it's, it's a bigger issue. It's a bigger trauma 
for the world and for America than just a dispiriting choice. The thing is, this is a perilous time in world history. China's on the rise. We've still got uh, the West uh, fighting a proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. And we need strong leadership from mm -hmm. the US and, and we sure ain't getting it. Mm. Aaron, do you agree? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think, you know, even our own Prime Minister is saying, you know, the most perilous time in 80-odd in years, and, and it is, it's, it's terrifying. And, and China's intentions in Taiwan are, are no secret. They, they say it very openly and still no one here seems to believe them. We're completely unprepared for what that will do, and particularly in this region. Uh, look at Israel, look at Gaza, look at the Houthis and Iran using their proxies to attack America. I mean, we are on the brink of something terrifying and strength is the only thing that will deter that from happening. And, I mean, if Donald Trump the answer, who knows? But at the moment, it's, it's awful. The choice isn't great. But I think Trump will probably welcome Kennedy running because I think it will split the Democrat vote much more than it would impact his. Mm. Well, moving on, the fallout over Princess Catherine's Mother's Day photo continues. And to recap, this image was posted on Instagram and it was quickly taken down by news agencies. And Princess Catherine then wrote an apology claiming it was her editing skills. Erin, I can't believe it that Kate had to take the blame for this. This is absolutely ridiculous, the whole thing, in that clearly the photo was not from last week. And the only issue with all of this is that the royals confirmed to a media outlet that it was taken last week. Stupidly said, oh, it was taken last week. They didn't say that in the picture. I mean, often the royals will put out a family picture that was that's old or taken last spring or, or for whatever purpose, a, a happy birthday William picture that was from last year. It doesn't matter. But when the media agencies asked, when was this taken, someone said, oh, last week. And you just stupid. Otherwise... It's not a no. big deal because it wasn't taken last week, quite clearly. I've gone so deep into these theories. So, <laughs> it was November. She was wearing the exact same outfit, the same ribbing on the turtleneck. They have coloured it black, which is utterly ridiculous. Charlotte is wearing the exact same jeans, same shoes, same frill neck top. You don't it's, wear that kind of top wild. twice when I you're a royal. The Kensington Palace, <laughs> so the stupid. PR department have done such a bad job and I think it's so unfair. Is Kate that sitting Kate, there editing? Kate's, Kate's recovering from abdominal surgery. <laughs> I feel so bad for, for Princess Catherine. Chris, we know you're a strong monarchist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really, honestly, I, I couldn't have less interest uh, in, in, in the royals. But, but I, did, I did think the two princes married kind of well. I, I thought Meghan oh, yeah. and Catherine were attractive, stylish and seemingly intelligent women. I don't know how those women. princes got attractive yeah. women. Yeah. Yeah. God, yeah. must be their yeah. personality. <laughs> but they seemed intelligent and stylish as well. well yeah. now, we, we know, of course, we found out a couple of years ago that Meghan's bonkers, <laughs> right? So forget her. So Catherine was the great hope of the side for normality in the royal family. <laughs> now I'm starting to wonder what's yeah. going on here. <laughs> Wait a minute. The other thing is someone... And again, this is not my original thought, uh, so I, I, I don't claim it, but someone pointed out on social media the other day that, you know those pictures and, and that little film of the Queen with Paddington Bear? Ah, maybe uh. that wasn't real either. <laughs> <laughs> I saw actually on social media again. Thank you, TikTok. It wasn't on TikTok. But, gosh, things have fallen apart since the Queen died. She must have been holding that family Honestly. together. She used Ridiculous. to do all the photos. Oh, the <laughs> she didn't do it herself. <laughs> on and we'll just Microsoft believe it. Yeah. yeah, that's a thing. Well, I suppose yeah. they are kind of the royals. It appears that they're failing in the digital age because whatever photograph they would be able to present, we would of course believe them. And now they, they maybe can't get away think with it. That that people would zoom in. It's the royal. Like it just wouldn't, so wouldn't dumb. You, wouldn't, wouldn't you think? You know, this age-old anachronistic uh, 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 institution would just skip the whole uh, digital photos and Photoshop era and get in a royal portrait painter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. That would do the job. I don't Instagram's think it's real. too addictive. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> yeah. They yeah. want to be on it too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being on TikTok. Uh, Chris Kenny, Erin Mullen, thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Really appreciate it and great to have both your companies. Great thank to provide you, some aesthetic balance. <laughs> you really stick out, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's Power Hour. Thank you for your company. We'll see you next week.